So this um, event is happening for a whole bunch of wonderful reasons. One is that today is the day that women are gathering in Washington as a culmination of the World March of Women 2000. And uh, the publicity for that has, has indicated that, that this event has, um, I think, galvanized women more in other countries than in the United States. But we've heard that there's going to be a car caravan of women uh, coming from, from Mexico to take part. And then on Tuesday, the women who are in Washington are going to be at the United Nations and talking with Kofi Annan. So we thought we would have a, uh, an event here and uh, to support that, to celebrate what they're doing, and also to support the women from the University of Vermont who have gone down there. So I would just like to introduce for a moment Jessica Karsten, who is a member of the women's organization here on campus, which is called Women Organized for Radical Change. Mm -hmm. OK, you want to just? I don't know, say a word about what, uh, um, what's I'm happening. A, I'm a co-coordinator of women's organizing. Why don't you go up there and see? OK, so then, yeah, then the TV person can get you. Um, hi, I'm Jessica Karsten. I'm the co-coordinator of Women Organizing for Radical Change here on campus. Um, and I think it's great that, we're do that you got this all together today. Um, because my co-coordinator and most of the women in my group went down to the World March of Women. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the other sponsor today is uh, Burlington, a branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And leaflets about that and membership information is on the back table along with information about the Winona LaDuke Ralph Nader campaign. Um, so. In addition to the fact that today is an important day for women uh, nationally and globally, yesterday was a very important conference that we had here in Burlington about the independent media. And two women were, came up to that conference. And since they, I knew they would be here today, their planes don't leave until this afternoon, I said, we will get them. We will get them together. And this dynamic duo will help us understand the, um, the changes that have happened in the last century in terms of women's suffrage and women's rights, and then a perspective into the next century in terms of the future of global feminism. So our first speaker will be Blanche Wisson Cook, who uh, has recently published a two-part biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, and apparently a third volume is on its way. Uh, she also has um, written a book, which I have right here, Women and Revolution, uh, which is the biography of Crystal Eastman. So her, uh, her interest in uh, women as activists and agitators dates from women who were active at the beginning of the century. And I just want to read one short uh, quote from where Crystal Eastman was at. And she was a suffragette and activist in New York City in the first two or three decades of, uh, of this century. And she went to interview the woman who uh, pulled women together internationally to try to stop World War I, uh, Alida Jacobs, who was a, um, a doctor in Holland and um, got together something called the Hague, uh, the Hague Conference of Peace in 1915, which led to the creation of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So she asked Dr. Jacobs, when I asked her if she thought we might see the end of war in a generation or two, or if it would take centuries of education to bring it about, she said, oh no, women will soon have political power. Women's suffrage and permanent peace will go together. When the women of a country are eagerly asking for the vote, and a country is in the state of mind to grant the vote to its women, it is a sign that that country is ripe for permanent peace. Yes, the women will do it. They don't feel as men do about war. They are the mothers of the race. Men think of the economic results. Women think of the grief and pain and the damage to the race. 
If we can bring women to feel that internationalism is higher than nationalism, then they won't stand by governments. They'll stay by humanity. Well, um, we know that women got the vote in uh, 1920, and we still have war. But we also know that women have been in the forefront of struggling against war from then until now. So I'd like to invite Blanche to come up and fill us in with some of the rest of the history. And um, I'm just watching my watch because of knowing how we have to, uh, for like half an hour or 25 minutes or something well, like that. Maybe, maybe I'll. Thank you very much. Yes. Is this? Uh, you could move that if you like. Okay. Is that a, can you hear me? It's not a PA. It's not a PA. Does this work? No. There's Nothing. No no there is no PA, but yeah. you can all hear me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, re I'm very moved to be here on this World March of Women Day. Um, no. No, because there was further recording. What's wonderful is we have several. Sorry, did I just hurt your head? We have several people here from the conference yesterday Sorry. who are taking Sorry, this darling. For, uh, for playback in, in uh, your group. Is uh, well, I'm a radio producer and will go uh, from uh, Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts, uh -huh. across the country, and then yeah. the IMC on the internet. Uh -huh. IMC Great. is Worldwide. independent media center, so these mics are very Okay, I, I promise not to do any more damage to your mics. And I'm very moved that we're all here today, and I'm very grateful to Robin Lloyd and Charlotte Dennett and Jerry Colby for getting me here. Um, and I, you know, I was just in a room full of great activists um, at Robin Lloyd's house, and everybody has a story about how they became activists. And I've been very lucky in, in my life in that um, I've always believed that you can't go anywhere without your gang. And I've been very lucky that I've always had a gang, and the gang is always building and changing and growing. Um, and when you look at our history, I mean, this is really something women really understand. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt always said, governments exist for only one reason, and that's to make things better for all people. But you can never depend on politicians to do anything about that. You have to go door to door, block by block, community by community, and make your wants and your needs known, and organize and build movements and be part of movements. And it's only movements that are going to make a difference. And women understood that. Women understood that as they battled for suffrage. And it really um, is historic to be in a room of uh, uh, Robin Lloyd and Lola Moonfrog, whose ancestor Lola Maverick Lloyd uh, actually introduces the, you know, the word maverick, um, a family name, gets into the lexicon because these mavericks were such activists and radicals and in-your-face, up-front doers um, who, who did, who got arrested and spoke out and was blunt. And um, I've learned a lot in the 20 years. Of, actually, I've learned a lot from all the people I've written about. I learned a lot from Crystal Eastman, who, um, you know, I, I, I'm just, maybe we can pass this book around. It's, you can find it on the net. It's out of print. But it is, you know, folks do have it. And just two weeks ago, Crystal Eastman was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame. And this is a woman who got lost, completely lost to history. Nobody had ever written about her. And she was a friend of Jane Addams and a friend of Lillian Wald. She was absolutely pioneering. And she pioneered. She was the f one of the first women who got a law degree. She graduated second in her class from NYU Law School in 1907. And uh, then she did a big survey of Pittsburgh workers and how workers in mines and in factories were sickened by their lousy industrial conditions and, and you know, uh, factory workers lost their hands and their fingers and uh, sometimes their noses 
And it was always their fault. Oops, they walked into the apparatus. And she campaigned after she did this big survey. It was called the Pittsburgh Survey, and it was published in 1909. She, she said, well, obviously it's the industry's fault. Obviously we should have industrial responsibility and occupational safety and health. Um, and this was like 1911 and the first workers' compensation law, which then got very distorted, as we all know, um, was passed, which said industry is responsible. And today, of course, we have uh, the incredible backlash, but we also have the new movement. And this new movement, let me just say, I feel really good to be uh, a lifelong activist and to be part of these ever-changing and growing gangs, because this movement is back. And I've been really lucky enough to be on a book tour for Eleanor Roosevelt, Volume 2. Um, I was on a book tour in 1999 for the hardcover in, 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 in this year in June for six weeks, June and July, uh, all over the country. I was in almost every state except South Dakota, I think. Um, and everywhere I went, there was an incredible movement going on. People are so tired of the lies and the deceit and the poverty, and the fact that there are, right this minute, in this moment of triumphalism where the two main party candidates say, this is the richest moment in American life, and folks are really suffering all over the country and all over the world. And there are homeless people, seven to 10 million homeless people in the United States. And these leading politicians aren't addressing that at all. The only address they have is silence for the homeless people. And everywhere I went, folks are going to work and to school in their cars and their vans. However, everywhere I went, young people are involved in all kinds of movements. To make it clear once again, industry is polluting. The nuclear polluters are polluting. You know, low-level radiation kills people. These plants have to be shut down. Folks are really involved in this health movement. There's a, a global epidemic of cancer and AIDS and other immune deficiency diseases. And what's responsible for that? Well, we know what it is. Everybody knows what it is. And there's a giant cover up covering up the fact of what Rachel Carson said years and years ago. Everywhere you have everywhere you have these industrial pollutions mixed with this lethal, noxious radiation, you're going to have an explosion of death. And of course, we have an explosion of these immune deficiency diseases all over the country. And so folks are activists against it. This didn't start overnight. These great heroes around Crystal Eastman who founded uh, Crystal Eastman, back to her, founded the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I give her a lot more credit uh, than most people because I'm one of those, you know, I give my women credit. Yeah. Um, she not only called Aletta Jacobs, but invited some of the British women to the U.S. to meet Jane Addams. And it really was in 1915 that the Women's Peace Party started. And then it was 1919 that it was renamed the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And it is today a great and global organization. And I'm very proud to be a member of it. And I know that Robin's very proud to be a member of it. But even the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which is a global organization, is not enough. We have to be part of lots of other movements, um, all of the movements that really speak to, speak to our soul. And these women were part of lots of other movements. They created something called the National Consumers League. In 1903, Jane Addams, Lillian Wald, Florence Kelly created the National Consumers League. And their theme was don't buy. You know, you've heard that, don't buy where you can't work. Don't buy unless it has a union label. Don't buy things that are made under dreadful neo-slave conditions. Well, that's what Seattle's all about. That's what Prague is all about. You know, this, this giant corporatism depends on neo-slave conditions. And if you look around at this disgusting, in my opinion, disg I say my opinion a lot because I teach cops. Um, I teach at a place called John Jay College for Criminal Justice. And my students, uh, who are mostly police officers and other service officers, wear guns to class. 
Um, and so whenever I say anything really controversial, I say, in my opinion, in my opinion, I say it three times, I say it very fast, and uh, it's worked. I've taught there for over 33 years, and here I am. Um, so in my opinion, this is a disgusting moment in U.S. history. In fact, arguably, it is the meanest moment in U.S. history since slavery. And what workfare has done, what this, you know, we're going to end welfare as we know it, what it has done has been to end any kind of educational opportunity for women on welfare because they are single mothers, because they are poor women who are single mothers, raising their children who had an opportunity under welfare to go to college. At the City University where I teach, we have lost 24,000 students who are adult women succeeding, passing, doing well in college, and who were told by these miserable politicians, no, you have to go out and shovel garbage or le you know, rake leaves or do these neo-slave things without any opportunity for education in some other borough. We said, we said, no, no, let them continue their education and we will supply them with jobs at the college. We have work for them to do. And if you look at volume two of Eleanor Roosevelt, you'll see that that's what WPA was. That's what the National Youth Administration was. National Youth Administration, and it was integrated, and that is to say the budget was integrated. Black colleges weren't yet integrated, but students at black colleges, students at white colleges, I mean globally in the US, I mean, all students across the spectrum receive tuition and salary for doing work. That's what the National Youth Administration was. And welfare continued that, at least that. It wasn't great. It wasn't great, but it continued that. And now it's ended. It's ended. And so state by state, we're looking at this terrible loss of opportunity. As I said, we lost 24,000 students at the City University. We have a bill before the New York State Legislature which passed at least one house. It may have by the time I'm, I mean, by the time I get back, I may discover that it is passed. It's very close to passing, saying we want these students back at school and we will give them jobs at the college. And it is, as I said, very close to passing, but it has to be done now state by state. And what we're seeing in this mean moment, in this hideous mean moment, where these two people gush and bore, uh, is that their names? <laughs> gush and bore? Sounds right. No, Goren Bush, or Shrub, as Molly Ivins calls him. Um, not quite a bush, just a shrub. Uh, <laughs> Molly Ivins, a wonderful woman. Anyway, these people, they don't talk about this. They don't talk about this incredible war against public education. And let me just tell you, as I've gone around the country, there is an incredible war against public education. We at the City University in the last 10 years lost 40% of our budget and 60% of our full-time faculty. 60% of our full-time faculty. And I was going around saying there's a war against public higher education and Gerda Lerner, the great uh, feminist historian, pioneer, she was at a talk that I gave at Madison, Wisconsin. She came up to me afterward and said, we have to have lunch, you're wrong. She's a very critical woman. And uh, <laughs> so we had lunch, and she told me that she has just come out of retirement at the age of 80 because it's not a war against public education. It's a war against higher education. And this war against higher education is hitting every single college and university. They are breaking the faculty. They are ending tenure. And how they're ending tenure, it's kind of a stealth movement. How they're ending tenure is when folks who are old and retire and are full professors or distinguished professors, they're just not hiring in that line. And all across the country, part-timers, and I was talking about neo-slavery, and she says this is neo-slavery, part-time faculty, these are men and women, but mostly women, with PhDs are being hired 
as part-timers. And they're not even making a living wage. You can't make a living wage as a part-timer. So women, mostly women, 60% of the part-timers are women, are, put, are patching together jobs uh, for teaching job, for courses in two or three different colleges, and they make less than $20,000 a year. Well, that's not a living wage. That's not a living wage. And so this is happening all over the country at every single university. And Gerda Lerner is, has come out of retirement to fight it and is saying, you know, schools that don't have at least 50% full-time faculty should lose their accreditation. And she's on this national campaign. But that's not even the worst of it. The worst of it is, an, an example is California. In the last 10 years, California has built one college and 800 prisons. The worst of it is that we have criminalized poverty. We have criminalized poverty, and we have created this prison industrial complex. If you look at things historically, this is extremely bitter. This is extremely bitter. The abolitionists fought to end slavery. Four million slaves were freed in 1865. The population was much smaller. Four million slaves were freed in 1865. Today, there are two million people between the ages of 18 and 30 in prison. Mostly, 60%, mostly people of color and struggle. Two million people. Eighty percent of those people are there for non-criminal offenses, like being poor or, you know, marijuana. I mean, excuse me. And these are the draconian drug laws that have enabled the prison industrial complex to be this, you know, new center of neo-slavery. You know, folks work in prisons and the prisons are privatized, and you know they're doing work for corpse. I mean, something very pernicious is going on while our politicians celebrate how glorious and great it is. The fact is we now have two classes, the truly needy and the truly greedy. And a whole bunch of us who understand that, and the good news is, are organizing against it. And so if you look at the historical women, the women around Florence Kelly and Jane Addams and Lillian Wald, women who gave us public health nursing, settlement houses, the idea of social security, which is now very embattled. And if you look at my biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, you'll see what was wrong from the very beginning with social security. In 1935, Eleanor Roosevelt went on a national tour to protest the limitations of Social Security, not to celebrate what a great innovation it was. Now, it was a great innovation. It was the first time the government was responsible for the basic security of the poorest people in the United States. However, why she went on a national tour to protest it was that it came in completely segregated. And that was what was wrong from the very beginning with Social Security. What do I mean by completely segregated? Whole categories of worker was not, were not included. Workers that were not included were. All domestic workers were excluded. All farm workers were excluded. All teachers, nurses, and social workers were excluded. All Government workers were excluded, national, state, and local. And all people who worked in small businesses of under 10 were excluded. Now, if you pause to say, well, who was included and who was excluded, you see right away all domestic workers and farm workers, all teachers, nurses, social workers. You see right away 80% of women were excluded. Who were in those jobs? 80% of women were excluded, and about 70% of African American workers 
were excluded. Those were the jobs they had. Also, seamen, you know, merchant marine were excluded. And if you look at it, it's a vicious, vicious situation that set up a two-tier structure. Welfare for the not, you know, as Linda Gordon writes, for the pitied but despised, and social security for industrial workers who were mostly white men and their families and their notion of a family wage, which was very anti-woman. Since 1935, the goal was to enlarge this social security. But now we are living through a period where the goal is, quote, to privatize and end social security. So there is a war against the poor. And we're living through, one could even argue, we're really having basically a civil war. And one of the ways you can see that is if you just focus for a bit on homelessness. It fascinated me as a biographer that Eleanor Roosevelt, who was orphaned at 10, and it's sort of interesting, how did Eleanor Roosevelt become such a great hero, a great leader um, of people, a great-hearted, compassionate woman who identified with people in want, in need, in trouble, with people on the margins of life? Every time she visited a woman's prison, she would say things like, I could have been any one of the women on the inside. Well, where did she get that level of empathy? Of course, it might have meant also that she too could have killed her husband. I was <laughs> never quite sure what that meant. Um, but she had this great empathy. And where it came from, in my opinion, was that her father, who was her most beloved uh, person in her life, Elliot was a drop-dead alcoholic. In fact, he dropped dead at the age of 34. Now, we all know folks who drink too much, they're in their 70s and 80s already. Imagine how much you have to drink to die at the age of 34. And her mother, bitter and weary, died at the age of 29. She essentially turned her face to the wall and died. Eleanor was eight when her mother died and 10 when her father died. And after that, she never lived in a home of her own. Her uncle, Theodore Roosevelt, was president. Um, she was well-placed with aunts and uncles and a wonderful grandmother who really arguably saved her life and sent her away to school in England at a place called Allenswood, where she received a very wonderful education and a measure of her life, I think, is really rooted in this great place of liberal, spirited, feminist education, uh, where Eleanor became a star and really a, a great intellect. Although people actually have said to me, don't you think she's stupid? I mean, people have actually said that to me. Um, but she spoke many languages. And she said at the end of her life, when she was 76, she wrote a, she wrote a memoir you learn by living. And she said, the happiest day, the happiest day of my life was the day that I made the first team at field hockey. <laughs> Yay, Title IX. <laughs> I really paused a lot over that wonderful athletic uh, reality. After her entire life at the United Nations, she knew everybody in the world. She did everything. She had so many struggles and triumphs. Um, the happiest day of her life was the day that she made the first team at field hockey. And I, I really felt I understood her as a result of that. Eleanor Roosevelt was a team player. She's the one who always said, never go anywhere without your gang. And she loved sports, knockabout, sweaty, athletic sports, a team player. And her sport of choice was politics. She hated to lose. She always advised her friends, if you have to compromise, be sure to compromise up, <laughs> which is very good advice. And she never turned her back on a struggle or a fight or a battle. 
And it really fascinated me, ultimately. Eleanor Roosevelt was a very competitive woman. And that became not competitive in the bad sense, I win, you lose, there go your eyes. But in the good sense, personal best, we got to win. We got to win this one for the team. We got to win this one for the community. We've got to make it better. But also competitive. Um, when she held her first press conferences for women journalists only, because her great friend, wonderful reporter, Lorena Hickok, called Hick, said, why don't you, five minutes? She said, Hick said, uh, why don't you have press conferences for women journalists only? They're the first fired and the last hired during this Great Depression. And Eleanor Roosevelt did. She agreed to do that. And then at the end of the first press conference, she called Hick and said, it was great. It was a very wonderful affair. I'll go on with them. And the best news is I even beat Franklin. He's not having his press conference until next week. <laughs> and then to follow this competitive theme, it fascinated me that she gave herself the task the first year as First Lady of earning as much as FDR earned as President. <laughs> she wanted to earn as much as her husband. He earned $75,000, $1933. If you multiply by a factor of 10, that's a lot of money, you get how much he earned as President. And she insisted on earning the same, which she did, as a radio journalist and a columnist. And at the end of the year wrote a friend, I've done it. I've earned as much as Franklin. And she did every year until the end of the White House years. And then after that, of course, she earned much more. She was what we might call, indeed, a workaholic. And then if you look at his court, her court, uh, he brought Missy Lahand and they survived the Lucy Mercer affair. You've probably heard about the Lucy Mercer affair. Um, that was very early on, World War I. They survived that and their marriage was intact. And then he brought in Missy Lahand into uh, the White House. Uh, I'm sorry, 1920, <coughs> 1920, into their homes. They were not yet in the White House. They weren't even yet in the State House. But she lived with them, um, FDRs live-in companion in all of their homes to the end of her life. And Eleanor Roosevelt was always very gracious and warm to Missy Lahan, treated her with respect and affection, much as, you know, a medieval household, the second wife, the junior wife. Um, but Eleanor Roosevelt, real key to this, was that she wrote an article in 1923 called The Women of Tibet, in which she said, it has been brought to my attention that the women of Tibet have many husbands, which seems to me a very good thing, <laughs> since so many husbands have so many wives. So, you know, that explains as far as I'm concerned, Eleanor Roosevelt's growing commitment to the other people in her life, beginning with Earl Miller, this is in volume one, and no doubt, Lorena Hickok, everyone called Hick. You gotta read, to see the details, you gotta read the book. Um, but Eleanor Roosevelt, after her parents died, never lived in a home of her own. She always lived in other people's houses. And so it fascinated me that this woman who lived first with her grandmother and then away at school in England and then in her mother-in-law's homes, which she hated, chose and then in what she always called public institutions, the State House and the White House, chose as her commitment decent, affordable, excellent housing for all people. And that was her commitment. And she worked with a guy named Senator Robert Wagner, who is the author of the first really good public housing law and public housing authority to get really good, decent housing for all people. And one of my favorite chapters in volume two is a chapter about a place called Arthurdale. And Arthurdale is a rural community way up in the mountains of Appalachia in Preston County, West Virginia. And a lot of folks were saying, why are we gonna spend all this money on building really nice houses for these miners and former miners, many of whom were unionists and had been blacklisted in the 1920s and were out of work. 
And uh, why this community was chosen is because they were out of work from 1927 when they were blacklisted because they were called Reds, because they were Unionists, until 1933. And they were living in caves and culverts. And Eleanor Roosevelt was told, you want to see the worst place in Depression America, where folks are starving to death and living in caves. Come on down here to Preston County. And she went down and she said, we're going to get these people out of these caves by Christmas. And she said, we're going to build model houses. It's going to be model home building, what we now call sustainable community. And every house will be different. And every house will be on two to five acres. And they can build their own houses. All the government has to do is buy the land. And this can be you know, a multi-source housing development. But it will be nice. It'll have all modern conveniences, electricity, toilets, indoor plumbing. Two more minutes? Indoor plumbing, all modern, a refrigerator. And it will be, there'll be rhododendron. It'll be planted in rhododendron and mountain laurel. And Harold Ickes, the father of the Harold Ickes you know about today, said, if Eleanor has her way, how are we going to tell the rich from the poor? <laughs> and Eleanor Roosevelt said, well, in matters of such simple dignity and decency, we should not have to tell the rich from the poor. And the issue was indoor toilets. They really objected to that. But they were built. These houses were built the way Eleanor Roosevelt said they must be built. And everybody called this a failure. But I went down there with my partner, Claire Koss, and with some Wilk people, including one of the women who started the Beijing uh, train with you all. Um, and we went down, this is, from the point of view of the people in this community, it's a total success. 83% of the original settlers still live there. Their children and grandchildren still live there. Everybody works. Everybody went to school. It's a community of activists in what is still, it's called the Rust Belt now. It's still a benighted and impoverished community. So this is a center of hope. And we could build off the dales all over the country, but not one single federal dollar has been invested in new housing starts since Ronald Reagan. Not since Ronald Reagan. Now that means eight years of this Democrat president has not spent one single penny in new housing starts. And so we have a homeless crisis, a great tragedy, and I know it's time to stop. But it's why we have to keep organizing and go door to door with all the great vision that's out there. And there's some really great vision out there. And a lot of it is coming right from the community. It's percolating up. We need each other. The good news is we have each other. Thank you very much. Well, Blanche, that was wonderful. And I, I think. Um, Blanche has touched on the themes that uh, are very relevant to the march that's happening in Washington, which is focusing on poverty and on violence against women. So thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I brought. Um, <laughs> there are two things I wanted to say as folks organize. There's some wonderful troubadours. I brought just a few. Sandy Rapp, a great troubadour. Um, we the People, a great lesbian, feminist, songster. Um, and I brought a few of her. And I want to say there are a couple of sites on the net. The one good thing about this moment where the corporations have taken over so much of the airwaves is that on the net, there's something called commondreams.org. And if you look at, every day, if you, I put it on my favorites. If you look at www.commondreams, one word, .org, you get some of the best progressive news out of the country and out of the world. And on the left-hand side, you get all the good independent media, including Radio Pacifica and including you know, the Pacifica News Network, On Strike, the striking news network. Um, and you get really the folks that we need to know. And then on the, on the right-hand side are all the progressive journalists. And you can log on to any of the networks, any of the news, and get the stories in the middle. It's a great source of inspiration for those of us who like to do activism. Great. Thank you. OK. Uh, our next speaker is Njoki Njehu. Um, Njoki is a, an activist from Kenya 
who got her start in activism, well, from her family. I've been hearing a bit of her, her family history this weekend. But uh, her first contact with the international women's movement was at the World Conference of Women in Kenya in 1985, where she was a translator and met feminists from around the world. Since then, she's worked for Greenpeace and is now the director of the uh, 50 Years is Enough campaign. That's 50 Years of the World Bank is Enough since 1998. Um, I've known Njoki for, I don't know, since before 98. I don't know when it was, but this movement was very small then. And uh, we would go to conferences and, and uh, protests at the World Bank, and there would be maybe a 1,000 people. Or once we had a really big march in Washington with Bread and Puppet that was maybe five or 6,000. But as you know, since Seattle and since, uh, since Washington, D.C., where there was a, a major demonstration against the World Bank this April, this whole movement has just burgeoned incredibly. So Njoki has been on the front lines of this struggle and has also uh, pioneered within the 50 Years is Enough uh, campaign a focus on gender issues and how issues of structural adjustment Im imposed by the World Bank uh, impact on women globally. So she will be talking to us about that. And I think also I'm hoping she will touch on uh, the uh, importance of US feminists, who I think we are in a privileged position here to be somewhat more sensitive to actually the realities of global feminism. And I'll let you explain about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good afternoon when um, people who care about women and women get together to talk about what's happening in our world. And um, this is another one of those circles um, created by women of women and, and men who support women that I have um, had the privilege and, and honor of being invited to. And I'm, I appreciate this a great deal, Robin. Um, I, um, when, when I was called and asked to come up for this independent media conference and I was thinking, oh God, this is you know this was going to be the one weekend in uh, in October. I'm gonna be home, um, and then they said, well, Robin Lloyd is involved in this, and I said, okay, I have to go. Um, and they didn't they didn't know why I decided to go, but that really was the reason. And then when I talked to Robin and she said that she was organizing this event, then I thought, well, then I can participate uh, in uh, the World March of Women, an, an event that is related to that, that I did want to be part of. And I was, and maybe this is where I, was, I will start and, and go on to other things. Um, I was despairing of what was happening in Washington, which I don't think is really, um, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I went and met with some folks at the National Organization for Women, and I, um, I got very uh, disappointed because it felt like they weren't really realizing how important this was. The first time I heard about the World March of Women was you know, something that was mentioned and it kind of went out of my head. And then I went uh, to a conference in, um, in Geneva, Switzerland in June and met the, one of the women from Quebec. There were two women from Quebec, who, which is where this idea of the World March of Women started. And uh, I mean, they were very energetic, radical, radical feminists. And, and you know, we, are, we are drafting a declaration from this conference that had 600 people from 60 countries in Spanish, French, English, and Italian, and we don't have translators, and people are trying to get understood and trying to, under, to explain what we mean by the feminization of women. And 
uh, Lorraine guy, who is this woman from Quebec, is trying to explain it to these French men who, I, who think that this is a horrible thing to say. And we go into the into planner, and this woman gets up and says, "I think it's a really terrible thing that you're using this feminization of poverty. It makes women victims." And you know, then in in this huge planner, you're trying to explain why this is the proper word to use. And I got really excited, and I came back to Washington, and I called the National Organization for Women, and went and met with the, the woman who was organizing this. And I realized that they, it was something that they, they had taken on, but I didn't feel that there was a commitment, which the yeah, the, the National Organization of Women are the U.S. sponsors, and I asked um, what is the focus of what, you know, what are the demands, and they said equality, violence, and poverty, and I said, and what do you say about those things? Uh, and very limited again, and I said, I think you're going to have problems getting a lot of people to support this. You know, those are three great themes, but it is so much broader what ails women in this country and what I think, where I think we are. I mean, you know, um, Seattle changed a great deal in terms of where the politics of justice for women, for the environment, for workers, for children is. I mean, it, it's one of the most exciting things that has happened. And we can make radical demands that before we were worried about making because they would alienate people. And when you ask for too little, which I think as women, even as feminists, we tend to do, we don't really believe sometimes in the, in the, in, in the greatness and the urgency and the, and the justice aspect of, of our causes. And I think that that's what has happened. And you know, the woman said, you know, we've tried to get all these people who supported the April mobilization in Washington, and we are, they, are not, they are not signing on. They are not supporting. I said, you know, from knowing some of these characters, this is too low. They want more, and this is too limited. And so th this is probably what is happening. And I said, for, for the 50 Years is Enough Network, th these are the things we would want to see in such a thing that is being put forward as part of the US demand for the World March of Women. And I encourage people actually to go to the web and look at the International Declaration, because it's very comprehensive, very long, very comprehensive, but it really weaves all the issues that impact women's lives. One of the things that they're doing in Washington today is to march by the World Bank and the IMF. I have tried many, many times, and I'm sorry to say this, and the National Organization for Women doesn't really quite get it where the economic issues and international economic issues come into in terms of what is happening to women around the world. I do believe that slogan that sisterhood is global. I believe sisterhood must be global, should be global. And I think that one of the challenges of women living in the United States is to radicalize the feminist movement to reclaim it and to weave peace and justice issues, to weave women's rights and children's rights and environmental rights in what we are doing. And uh, this is an incredible opportunity. Over, I think, 150 countries, the World March of Women is being observed. And, you know, and it feels, to me, it feels quite absent in the United States. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think that this gathering is really important. And I, I wanted to participate in the observation of this day in a way that I felt honored what I think are some of the issues out there. So I, I think it's great, Blanche, that you started us with this historical perspective of where women activists in the United States have been, you know. Uh, and to see what could be accomplished by women of principle, women of vision, and women of justice. And I think that people are narrowing more and more. You know, you, you get to these UN meetings and you find these rural women from Haiti who are radical, radical people who are talking about structural adjustment programs. And US women activists have sort of this glaze over their eyes, and they don't get it. They do, they're like, what are structural adjustment programs? And part of what I'm going to be doing today is explaining what structural adjustment programs are, not only in 
the 90 countries where the World Bank and the IMF have been imposing them, but in the words of Malcolm X, in the ways that they are coming home to roost in the United States. Because we have seen this assault in all of these different ways. Um, and some of the, I think, real questions that we need to be asking is when we hear about things that are going on in the, in the world, uh, what is happening to women? You know, you hear about the Asian financial crisis, where in South Korea they decided to do this huge bailout, but the stipulation of the bailout said that small and medium-sized enterprises, which equal women's businesses, were exempted from the benefits of the Asian bailout. Most people don't even know this. We fail to ask these very basic questions but very fundamental questions. Are women being heard in South Korea? You know, to use that example, which had really some very, very dramatic examples. Women and men were giving up their children, abandoning them outside orphanages. They were called IMF orphans because of the dishonor of not being able to feed and house their kids. And the best thing that they could think to do for them is to abandon them outside orphanages where they would be taken by the, the monks and, and uh, religious communities that would raise them. We heard about IMF riots and IMF uh, robberies and all those kinds of things. IMF suicides where people who could not be able to get a job because of the Asian financial crisis were deciding that the best thing that they could do under the circumstances was kill themselves. And often it was men who, because in, uh, in those contexts, they are supposed to be supporting their families and leaving women destitute with, children's, with children to raise. Are women being seen and considered under the structural adjustment programs of the World Bank and the IMF, which are a package of economic reform programs, which include privatization, which include currency devaluation, which include a loss of credit for farmers. And in Africa, 70 to 90% of the food that is consumed domestically is grown to the, by, by women. This according to the UN, to the United Nations, not according to me. So when the loss of credit for farmers happens, it means that it's women who no longer have credit to grow food. It means that when we hear about malnutrition and, and famine and, and, uh, and drought and all of those things happening, they're happening because women no longer have the resources that they need to fulfill their obligations and their roles within the family, uh, family uh, uh, networks. Women are heading in most of Africa up to 60% of the households because even when they are in marriages, the husbands and the men in their lives leave the rural areas and go to work in urban areas. So, I mean, this is a familiar story, you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, 30 years ago in this country. All of these things are things that are happening to women. And when we look at the impact of health and education, uh, the in impact to health and, and education of structural adjustment programs, we see that there is no longer money available for schooling, and families have to pay tuition fees or user fees, or you know it gets called very nice things, community financing, cost sharing, all of those things. And when families have to make decisions about who gets an education, the boys get an education. Uh, you know, going way back, my mother has an eighth grade education because. My grandmother, who was raising 10 children on her own, had to make the decision. And she decided that each of her children would get a certain amount of education. And then uh, they would have to get out of school because an another child was ready for schooling. And there was only enough money to educate one or two children at a time. And so uh, we had uh, my mother had to drop out of school. And her brother got an education. She was, I mean. You know, I've met uh, way back when I met two of my mother's teachers, and they all talked about what a great student she was. And she's a really smart woman. And every time I get a little cheeky, she would say to me, the only thing you can do better than I is speak English. Otherwise, don't think that you know 
a lot more than I do. And it is true. I mean, she's, she's a really wonderful, wise woman. And uh, I learned a lot, uh, as I said this morning when we were having breakfast, when I thought I wasn't paying attention and it's like this you know, spring and you're sitting there and you go, oh my God, she said this is what would happen and it's happening and she was right. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> you almost just, you know, we, we all hate to have our mothers be right about all, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, and um, so, but I, you know, I learned a lot and, uh, and it wasn't that she said she was teaching me, but I think she knew what she was doing, but I didn't know that uh, what she was doing. But it's, it's a real, um, real issue in terms of what's happening to women around the world. Um, and there are wonderful things happening to women around the world. I mean, I, um, I, I feel very privileged. And I, I, I went from the time I was in fourth grade all the way through high school, I went to only girls' schools uh, in Kenya. And I, I measure uh, the fact that I'm very privileged because until last year, in July of last year, in all the years that I had gone to school, it was the first time that I met somebody that I went to school with in this country. I mean, we are talking about hundreds of young women who we went to, through school together and that I had been in the United States and I was doing all the kinds of things I was doing and my path and the path, and it's, it's a small Kenyan community in the United States, I had never crossed paths with a woman who went to school at the same time. I mean, not even just in my class, but we were at the school at the same time. And that, for me, is a, a measure of the privilege and, and the blessing and the, and, the, and the luck that I have enjoyed. Um, and because of the role that the World Bank and the IMF have had in our countries, in many countries around the world, women are getting the short shrift over and over and over again in health, in education, in all kinds of opportunities that are available. Women are being expected as well to pick up, to make ends meet. The governments no longer have money because of debt, because of corruption, because of bad planning, because of many, many reasons. No longer have money to provide health and education and food security programs and, and, food, and subsidies for food and all kinds of basic necessities. But the governments you know, really don't have to worry about it because the women will pick it up. You know, I have a friend who said to me, I'm not really sure whether this is you know, women picking up the, the strings and making things, you know, struggling to keep things going, whether it's really the right thing to do, or should they just say, no, we are not going to do this, and then the system will collapse on itself and they will have to deal with it. But of course, you know, at some level, that's a theoretical question because you're talking about letting your children starve even at greater rates than they're starving right now. And of course, we are not going to be, women are not going to let that happen. I mean, they are fighting to the nail as their children uh, starve and, and, and die from water contamination and lack of immunization and all of that. And as we look as people who have vision, who have opportunities, who have, um, who have access to sharing information, to gathering information, the quest question is, what is our obligation? What should we be doing? And I think that part of our obligation and our responsibility is to work and act in solidarity with other women and to work in ways that are building and supporting women as they try to struggle and all of these different uh, situations in our own communities and in communities around the world. And not just in those, you know, uh, awful, awful situations, but the, the, the situations that are in the headlines, but in all of those other ways in which women get below the radar and they die by the thousands and the millions. Uh, and we somehow don't even know that it's happening. Um, there are 34,000 children, according to the United Nations, 34,000 children who die every day from preventable and curable diseases, 34,000. It comes to something like 12 million children 
who die because their parents can't afford 12 cents, 12 American cents worth of immunization. They don't have access to clean water. They're dying of things like diarrhea that we know how to treat. They're dying of all kinds of things that are really you know, not rocket science in terms of what we need to do to end this genocide. And it is a genocide. It is an absolute genocide when you think about 34,000 children at single, every single day. And we have bought into, you were talking about the economic boom, we have bought into, as Howard Zinn says, this idea that the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average every single day is an indicator of how we are doing. And Howard Zinn said, imagine the difference it would make if every single day, instead of every local TV station, every radio telling us how the Nikken and the Dow Jones Industrial Average performed, that they repeated, in fact, instead, the fact that 34,000 children die today from preventable and curable diseases, and how it might change our worldview of what is going on. We wouldn't think that we, this was a prosperous time. We wouldn't think that this was a time when all is well. We would, in fact, believe what is true, that all is not well, and our world is crumbling in many, many ways, even in countries like the United States. Let's talk about structural adjustment programs in the US. Welfare reform. This is exactly what the World Bank and the IMF have been telling governments to do in other countries. The, the sad part of it for the United States is that the government is doing this. It's not being forced to do this, but there is this idea, you know, they talk about personal responsibility. That wasn't that what welfare reform was supposed to be about. They talked about welfare queens who, you know, who have child after child so that they can get those monthly checks. Well, you know, somebody made a joke and said, only a man can think and believe that a woman will go through nine months of pregnancy and childbirth for something like $100 more in, an wealth, in terms of a welfare check. It is not that much money. Uh, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom did a post about who are the real welfare queens. And it's the corporations. And it is these wealthy, wealthy people, you know, uh, who are getting, you know, from, I think it's Sam Donaldson who got lots and lots of money to to raise sheep in Montana. He, you know, that's, that's the welfare that we are talking about. You know, he got public lands uh, made available to him, like they have made public lands available to all kinds of corporations. It's, it's ADM and McDonald's that are getting huge amounts of money, billions of dollars to advertise and to, uh, to get market access in China and in India and in all these other places. And they're telling us that it is those you know, $200 welfare checks that they're sending to, uh, to poor women and to, to in support of children who need uh, uh, round the clock care, that that's where all the money is going, that that's where the abuse of the system is. Um, in fact, people in this country have come to, you know, when you get into sexism, that's where the women piece comes into it, and then you get into racism, where in fact, instead of, a lot of people believe that, um, you know, probably 95% or 99% of, of people on welfare are black women. It turns out that 64%, I believe, of the people on welfare are actually white men and women. It's not, you know, and, but the racism is so deeply ingrained in, uh, within the United States that people, when asked that, they say it is uh, almost 100%. And these are the things that, are being done, and when we remain and refuse to actually question these, these images and this information that gets put out, then we let the lies succeed. We let, we let the lies persist, and we let the attack and erosion of hard-fought and hard-won rights be totally taken away. Um, and 
as as I think about today and I and I think about what lies ahead for us as global citizens, as part of the global sisterhood, I realize that what lies ahead for us is a real struggle to make sure that not only do we stop the erosion of all these rights that we have fought for, that those who have gone before us have fought for, but that we begin to reclaim and win them back. How do we roll back welfare, so-called welfare reform? How do we stop the, pr the prison industrial complex? How do we stop privatization? You know, uh, I hope that a lot of people have heard about um, the struggle in Bolivia against water privatization in uh, the community of Cochabamba, where peasants and workers and farmers said, no, this is not going to happen. They are not going to take our streams, pipe that water, and charge us for it. And they stopped it. And it was, this was, the World Bank was behind a lot of this. And now Bechtel, which was the company involved after they kicked their ass out of Bolivia, they're now in San Francisco. And guess what? They're going to privatize San Francisco's water. They tried it in Cochabamba, and I hope that the people of San Francisco kick their asses all the way into the middle of the ocean. Because if they, if they succeed in San Francisco, we are next. It doesn't matter where you, where you live. It is the privatization of the commons, be it water. Soon they're going to, you know, they're going to be privatizing air. They're going to be charging us for all kinds of things that are in the global commons and saying that this is the right of someone to say this is for, for us. And if you want a piece of it, well, pony up the cash. That cannot be allowed to happen. And when you look at the uh, prison industrial complex, uh, Blanche touched on it. But one of the other things that I think is really quite interesting about this whole process is that it's part of the uh, economic globalization that they have in those prisons people who are answering phone calls for technical support. You know, you have problems with your computer and you call an 800 number, it is as likely that it will be answered by someone in Sri Lanka or in the Bahamas as it might be answered by someone in a prison in California or in Texas. It's, it's a little known fact about how the prison, in, prison industrial complex, I heard somebody talk about it and they said that actually they are criminalizing people so that they can't get a job anywhere. Then they put them in the criminal system where they get these high skills. And then once, if, if you serve a certain period of time and you get out, but then you get out and you have a prison record. So nobody is going to hire you. So most likely than, than not, they get into crime again, and they're back in prison, and now they have a job. Because you know, in prison, uh, somehow, the p fact that you have this prison record doesn't you know, uh, keep anyone from allowing you to take uh, credit card orders over the phone and all kinds of things. I mean, it, it's just, it sounds so insane. And the saddest part of it is that for a lot of people in this country, they're not aware of it. They're not aware of it. And if you can imagine that level of ignorance, in a country where, you know, I don't know how many newspapers there are in Burlington, but there are lots of newspapers one, in one. 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 OK. Paper, yeah, OK. Well, you have one. In Kenya, we have two English. In the entire country, we have two English newspapers, national English newspapers, daily newspapers in the entire country. But I mean, if you can imagine, if you begin to think about how many radio stations, how many television stations, all those, you know, even if they're corporate owned, how, how much information is potentially available for people, and they're not aware of these facts. Imagine how much less information is available for, for people in places like Kenya and uh, Haiti, India, Brazil, and all those kinds of other places. There's an African saying that if 
the green forest is burning or if the green trees are burning, imagine what is happening to the dry trees. They're just you know, going up like that. And that's really it's part of what we face. I am out of time, but I do want to say one last thing, and it's to weave in the, the issue of HIV AIDS. And we have heard all the terrible things and all the statistics about how many orphans and all the kinds of things that are going on. But there are two things that have not been talked about or that are not really being talked, up, talked about. And I want to put them out here and uh, for people to consider. And I was talking to a colleague from Kenya who is working for the World Council of Churches in Geneva. And he said that the environmental impact of the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa is just beyond belief. With these millions of people dying, thousands of people dying every day, trees are being cut down left and right to build coffins. The, con the continent, after all the work that has been done by all sorts of people and organizations to plant trees, is being decimated and deforested at alarming, alarming rates. So the environmental impact of the HIV AIDS crisis. And the other one is the psychic trauma being experienced by communities, and especially parents who, and grandparents who are burying their children and their grandchildren. And that when they, went, they go and talk to people about what is happening in terms of this crisis, they hear as much as about the, the people who have died as the grief that parents and grandparents burying their grandchildren and children are experiencing. And it's not even in the radar of all the people who are talking about all these different things. And so I want to put those out there. And in most cases, it is women who are on the receiving end in terms of, for lack of a better phrase, of having to pick up families and raise orphans. Uh, they're the ones who are being infected left and right by husbands and, and male members of their families and, and their community returning from urban areas where HIV is a lot more prevalent. And there's no access for medication and treatment. So I want us to think about all of these things that are impacting us and say that, again, sisterhood is global, must be global, should be global. And therefore, we need to figure out ways in which we are going to support each other as women, as as feminists, men and women, who care about the future of the planet and who care about the future of the global family. And the absolute last thing I want to say is that um, I believe that it shouldn't just be the promise keepers and the lesbian avengers who recruit. I recruit, too. If you want to get information about the work that we are doing on the World Bank and the IMF, I'm going to pass this down that way and down that way. And please sign your name. We have a newsletter, we have email, and I hope that we continue to work together. And I thank you so much for your attention and your presence here today. Well, thank you so much, Njoki. Uh, we have time for maybe uh, uh, well, seven or eight minutes of questions, though it would be good if one person were to go out to the parking lot, uh, and in case other people are coming to go on the car caravan with us, just to say, don't leave, we'll be there, we'll, a group will be joining you shortly. I'm just not sure whether someone, is there anyone leaving who could stand there for five minutes or so until we get out there? Um, are you, you're not, the pardon? The parking lot is right right across the street uh, on College Street. And you know, we, we will be there in five, 10 minutes. So if you could do that. OK, she's, she's willing. Thank you. Yeah, question. I want to, it's not a question, but I want to respond to what Njoki said about now and you know, a certain kind of liberal feminists and how they need to do more. It's really important. For example, when I talk about um, abortion rights, I talk about the fact that I used to say 40,000 children are dying per day. And you know, to make those connections, to say that you know, when, when pro-life people are talking about unborn fetuses that, and not having any concern for the fact that 34,000 
children already born are dying of preventable um, things, you know, to make those connections and to not be single issue and narrow and, you know, and to, to continue to do that. I mean, that's a way that it can be done. Yeah. I mean, I think, I didn't, I didn't hear you say the, the, the uh, reason why she, she was troubled with, with now um, grasp of the issues was that they were going to be marching to the World Bank and IMF and, and their demand was that more women be hired by the World Bank and IMF. And this is, you know, in other words, a kind of a, a reformist demand of if you have a few more women, and we kind of know that this doesn't really work if you have a few more women in a basically, uh, uh, you know, male-dominated and very hierarchical structure, that it, that that is really not going to make much change. Is that? And, and one of the other things about women at the World Bank and the IMF is that, in fact, the U.S. executive director at the World Bank is a woman by the name of Jan Piercy. Uh, she was uh, Hillary Clinton's college roommate, and uh, the 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 executive, the U.S. executive director at the IMF is also a woman, a woman by the name of Karen Lissikers. And now the the World Bank has recently hired a woman who used to be um, the common. Well, I don't know how. Let me. Let me just say that she was, she was, she ha she has a child. She had a child with Steve Biko, Stephen Biko from South Africa. La Mampela is her name, and she is the managing director of the World Bank. That's the highest ranking woman in the World Bank. But these are women who do not have a, pers a feminist perspective or a f or a gender analysis, and that's part of the problem of when women women organizations and feminist organizations say that what they want is more women in these positions because they're women who are not feminist identified and it is a problem because then we can be, you know, if that's the only demand you have, they say, yeah, of course, you know, we have women and they will point to all these women, but it doesn't mean anything in terms of um, uh, pushing forward a feminist agenda or even a gender analysis, forget a feminist agenda. They do not have a gender analysis, so well, they don't have any economics. Right, you know they don't care about poor people. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Any other questions over here? Gary. Uh, yeah, I think forever. I learned an awful lot at this lecture. Uh, the one thing that uh, a very powerful tool, of course, is available for women and men, uh, which uh, relates to. Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, came out in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when you talk about global family and global citizenship, that's right on the line of, of, of this declaration. I, I just wonder why that wasn't emphasized. Um, can I say a word about that? Because um, uh, I, beg for, I beg for two more minutes, and I got them, and then I felt I, I couldn't say any more. I want to say a word about the Declaration of Human Rights, and thank you very much. Uh, this is the man who's taken on the Declaration of Human Rights and made it a, a, a sort of world citizenship movement, um, Jerry Davis. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was told by the State Department, by the U.S. State Department, that she should not support the Soviet um, initiated economic and social rights. And if you look at the Declaration of Human Rights, and I really urge Wilf to maybe get some copies, which you can get for free from the UN, you know, those little handbooks. The Declaration of Human Rights really is the blueprint for what we could rally around today. All the rights for human beings are in that Declaration of Human Rights. And Eleanor Roosevelt uh, responded to the US saying we're not going to support, you know, the right for everybody to have a job, the right for everybody to have a vacation, the right for everybody to travel freely, the right for everybody to have health, education, welfare, and housing. She said, if we cannot support that, I will resign. And Truman said, no, 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 don't resign, support it. And so the Declaration of Human Rights came in in two parts, the civil and political rights, the covenant for the civil and political rights, and then the coverage of the treaty, and then the covenant for the economic and social rights. And one of the great tragedies of our recent history is that although we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, the U.S. has never really ratified 
the second covenant. We have never even had a national discussion over the economic and social covenant, which is now ratified by over 166 nations. There are 200 nations at the United Nations. But the U.S. has not ever even had a national discussion about it. Now, just to give a little historical perspective, the Declaration of Human Rights passed in 1948 at the Security Council, you know, in gen general, I'm sorry, at the General Assembly in Paris, and it passed. The U.S. signed on to it, but the U.S. did not ratify the covenant, making it really a binding treaty, until Jimmy Carter brought it up again in the 19, uh, early 19, late 1970s, 1977, and then actually George Bush pushed it through in 1991. So the U.S. became a part, a party to the Declaration of Human Rights, but just the civil and political rights. And really, I think one of the things we should all be organizing around is the economic and social rights, that we actually finally, finally, you know, what is a rogue nation? The United States is today a rogue nation. We've declared war on the United Nations. We refuse to sign the landmine treaty. We refuse to sign the new world court against human rights abuses. And we have never, we refuse to sign CEDAW, the Convention to End Discrimination Against Women. We're one of the very few countries in the world that doesn't abide by, that doesn't, hasn't ratified that. And we have never considered the economic and social rights. And I think this is something we can really rally around. And it's such a really good, um, rallying point. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess we should wrap it up. Thank you to